this was a very famous place back in the day. It seems like most of the people that became somebody at least worked here or started here. Um, a lot of famous race cars came through this place, and a lot of famous race drivers came through this place. So it's got a ton of history. Everything that he did was was good stuff. I mean, I don't know that he ever he never built a car that didn't work. Right. You always knew that you were getting first rate stuff. He has two brand new cars this year called a Dragon. John Martin and Sheldon Kinder driving those. And I have what is called a Kingfish. He didn't go around with a briefcase and a, no. and a, you know trying to knock on doors trying to sell stuff. They came to him because of his reputation. In Europe, usually they have a designer and then they have builders and and they build parts and make the car from blueprints. In this country, we usually build the car and then make the blueprints afterwards. It's more accurate that way. You could put Al Hunter in a, in a car and let him go, and he'd park it. And Foyt would get in and drive and say, this piece of junk. No two driver necessarily has the same feel for a car, and Grant was able to figure out what they needed, understand what they needed, and give it to them. And we think we should have to build more, a more streamlined car. A slicker car, you know, I might, might say, a smaller machine so that can go through the air a little faster. And this car, if you notice, is only, it's only eight inches there. I probably realized that, uh, how interesting the race cars were when I was probably three years old, fell in love with the race cars. Me and Grant always got along very well. Always uh, called him Uncle Grant. On my fourth birthday, I was given my first race car by Jim Herdebeast, Ralph Liguori, and Grant. Dale Burton was here, his daughters, a lot of people. So probably from my fourth birthday, I've had a race car from then till now. Not too many people that have had race cars for 46 years. As far as the racing, we're still very passionate about our sprint cars and champ dirt cars. And, and you know, we've got some formula cars and we're still heavily involved in racing. And it's just as important as it ever was. Gary Weeks set the record. He worked for Grant for three years, you know? It was a record employment. Probably, yes. Yeah, Single term right. employment. Nobody would worked for him that long before ever. How'd you and Grant get along? Well. I don't care for Grant. I didn't care for Grant. I really didn't. Did you get along good with Doors? No. No? I like you because you're, you're not PC, Pookie. You never have been. We had to talk to uh, the Doris King some more about her husband. Uh, Tell us, does he ever get home during the month of May? Well, I'm really fortunate because our shop is at our house. The other mechanics on the team don't see their husbands very much, I'm afraid, the wives. <laughs> but uh, they work during the month of May. They work a lot of nights straight through. And then um, 12 o'clock is really getting off early. Doris was kind of the business person, or at least the PR person because Grant wasn't very good with people and, and he had a, a vocabulary of his own. He could be a little volatile from time <laughs> to time. Grant would get these telephone calls that would drive him up the wall and he'd throw the welding helmet across the room and Jim Bob would cheer him on and I mean, it was crazy. <laughs> but it was, it was a great time, it was so much fun. You know, it's, it was just so much fun. I miss it because it's not the same anymore and but I still love it just as much. He was just really well known among, um, in the racing community, for good and bad. <laughs> right. But more good than bad. I mean, we had a great time. Right. And, and all the characters seemed to end up here. I don't know just exactly why. Uh, if people were in between jobs or whatever, but yeah. all the characters seemed to end up here. 
the, the chief mechanics and some of the crew members were as well known as some of the drivers. I, I remember when I first came to work for him, and uh, it was in January. So I walk in, and there's a pile of 70, 72 T6 aluminum, and a pile of 4130 stock and everything. That was the car. That was in January. That was the car. <laughs> and then by the May, we had two cars built, and they were qualifying at the Indianapolis. In the 70s, you had five guys that would build an Indy car from the ground up out of a flat piece of aluminum in, you know, four months, five months. That doesn't happen anymore. Somebody can bowl the part on. That's about it. How many race drivers nowadays could you say, hey, you got to build your own engines and help assemble the cars so you can go run the 500? Well, when I started, you bent it, you, you had a pattern, a piece of cardboard or a piece of wood, and you heat bent everything you put on the car because we didn't have tubing benders. So a lot of the fabricators that came through these doors went on and, and became primetime people in their own scenario in racing. I mean, you had Dave Flick. You know, I think anybody that worked for him, you come out on top. I mean, well, I did. A lot of guys did well for themselves. Yeah, I did really good. I drove, I, I won several championships like in Edmonton and Calgary. If you interview Billy Vukovic to Johnny Parsons in the same interview, there is an abundance of difference there. They still are good people and get along and respect each other. They might not tell you that, but they do. Finally, I, it ran out of track or tire and I ended up... He ran out of talent is what he's trying to tell you. <laughs> This was a neat piece that you gave me a while back about the four ladies, same year, and all of you got your mechanics license. First four women to get your mechanics license. It was all together. It was you, Kay Bignotti, Kay Bignotti. and Wanda Knepper, and Dana Johnson, which I believe worked with Bignotti's wife. Yeah, I'm not sure. And the, the four of you were the first ladies to even we're allowed to walk through the gates at the speedway. According to the articles that I that I have seen and that I have, it said that I was the first registered licensed mechanic, and then I was also a registered car owner and also a registered promoter of the Indy Sprints. So um, your Indy cars with Tom Sneva. And then Penske hired him away from us. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It didn't take long, did it? And, and, then, and then he won. Much launched Tom Sneva's career. Yes, I, I feel that way. <laughs> I hope he feels that way. Yeah, I hope he does too. I can remember I went out to qualify the first time and just getting up to speed and they had to throw the red because it started sprinkling. And so then we went out again and we got three laps in and sort of going through turn two on the last lap, I could feel it starting to see some raindrops on the windscreen. But I looked down at the other end, the north end of the racetrack, and it was almost the sun was out at that end. And I'm just praying that they don't throw the red before I complete the lap and get my qualifying attempt in. Fortunately, and because it was clear at the other end, they let it go, and I got to the checkered flag, and then it was just a downpour turn one. And Grant gave Merle his first shot yeah. in IndyCar. Here's this little old lady, about four feet eight or whatever, mm -hmm. and she says, what happened to your arm? And I said, I went, I was driving an Indy car and I went three laps and I crashed and I lost my one arm. And she goes, I'm glad you didn't go six laps. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> when you look at the history of Grant King and all the, his drivers and his cars and everything he has, I, I'm sure I, I'm probably one of the most famous and I have three laps in one, in, in one oh, race. Nice. <laughs> Running at Pikes Peak, uh, I like that. That was, I think that was a dirt car. And, it was a specially uh, built car that Grant built for Al Hunter. Well, Grant King was a car builder in Indianapolis. I talked to Grant about uh, building a car and he, uh, he says, well, we can build one. He was a very good craftsman. He could build them in a hurry and to your liking. So we took everything we knew about all the race cars that are sitting in here and tried to adapt them to that car. And Mario ended up driving Mario, it because yes. Al and Parnelli were messing around the infield, remember, on a rain out, and Al broke his leg. Oh, my. No, I don't remember yeah. that. Yeah, and so... Granatelli painted Al's car up in the fluorescent orange number two. Mario drove it and won the race. You know, uh, I'm talking about Grant King and Doris. I, I just, I loved them both dearly. And the Droofy brothers and what they've done. 
and support and Grant and all of his drivers. I mean, you can name off all of his drivers, but Grant, he had a special way with people. And uh, so did Doris, yeah. His wife, Doris, picked up some parts and says, uh, we're gonna buy you a place. I said, huh, <laughs> I didn't know it was for sale. I give her a price of about double what we paid for it. And she said, Grant will write you a check tomorrow. <laughs> it was it was very exciting because we had this big shop that we could really we could really have a place to do what we wanted to do. Right. And keep going on different stuff. The fact that he was able to keep going, um, not everybody could have done that. And I think that says a lot for him and a lot of people that were like him. Because they had they had so many friends and so many associates where they could uh, just bag, borrow, and steal, and, and uh, well, bag and borrow, let's put it that way. Our sponsors uh, uh, sometimes are only $1,000 or $2,000, and uh, you just had to work hard, and you had to do other work uh, for other people in order to make the money to participate in, in your own racing. It was, right, and, and every year you guys would run two to three cars at the speedway. And <laughs> the biggest, the biggest, uh, sponsor was Evil Knievel, and uh, he ended up owing us a bunch of money. <laughs> you know, I always remember that Grant, you know, even though he was never a high-budget guy, you know, the wheels were always polished, everything was always clean. I mean, it, he, he did a lot with what he had. He always did. I mean, he, he was proud of his equipment and how it looked, and, you know, back then race cars were just, you know, they, were, they reflected the personality of the people that put them together. Yeah, they did. They had their own personalities, really. And he always built, you know, really pretty sprint cars. He was such a hard worker, just driven. I used to feel bad for him, you know. He'd come down from the house in the morning with his hair still flat from bed, and he'd just come down here because we were working. He had to be down here working with us. Of my life, um, every day I'd be here after school or, or working. But I can remember one week I made eighty dollars, mm -hmm. and I was still going to school. And he paid me a dollar an hour. <laughs> That's Grant. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so he took him every place, and he was just as proud to show him off, and Bill was as proud to go with him. Grant was a big part of my life. He was uh, kind of a father figure to me. Uh, he taught me a lot, a lot of good things, a lot of bad things, but when I put it in perspective, it all works out good. Um, learned a lot of things that were valuable, and I still use them to this day. What, what happened in the accident? Um, he ran a stop sign. Got hit in a little junky Ford Ranger pickup truck, and that, that was it. Uh, Jan kept the business running, I believe, three years after Grant had passed. Everything had dilapidated, and, and when you, you know, it just wasn't good. And I got a phone call one day that says, Billy, you need to come by the shop. They had really let it go. Yeah, it was bad. It was bad. And uh, I remember you saying, Billy, you need to buy this place. And I remember looking around and saying, why? But I grew up here and I, I wanted it back like it was, you know. And me and Stephanie decided we'll go back with the original 1970 face of the building, and that's the way it looked in 1970. And it's really cool that we could come here and enjoy the shop. It's completely, it's very much like the Grant King shop, but it's, it's really nice. You've done a great job here. It's a pleasure to come back and visit Thank and bring you. these memories back and to share with people that really well, care and want to hear about it. It's important that some of the kids hear from you guys. If you have any interest in the history of midgets and sprint cars and champ cars and Indy cars, you definitely need to come by Grant's old shop and see what Billy and Stephanie have done to this place. Um, it's actually nicer than it was that I remember, it's, 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 they've done an incredible job. Uh, this place is history. It's, there's never going to be anything like it again, and, and you really have to come check it out. We have to learn to appreciate and learn the story about those people and, and what they've done from the race drivers to the fabricators to the mechanics to the helpers to the 
the shop people, the secretaries, a lot of people involved, but, and it's all history. When I walk in here, it's 40 years flash by. Mm -hmm. It's in my mind. 40 years ago, I was here doing building things. And you forget so much until you start talking about it and things just keep coming back, coming back that, that what, you had, uh, what you did and created and, uh, and performed with. So it's, I think everybody that can walk should come in here and see this and get a feeling of what really went on here and, and what's happened, what kind of history was made here. And uh, there's only one place like this in the world and it's this place.